the book is called Delaying Doomsday, um, and it was published at Oxford Press in 2020, just a few months ago. Um, and I think the book is trying to do a couple of things. First, it's um, really trying to provide sort of a, a historical overview of what turns out to be a very common phenomenon, or much more common phenomena than I think many people realize, which is um, the conditions under which states actually relinquish or give up nuclear weapons programs. Um, and from both the academic and sort of, um, you know, civilian perspective, that's really good news. That's like a really nice, positive, sort of optimistic thing about the international community that I think a lot of people don't always realize when they look at just the cases that are ongoing or just the countries that still have nuclear weapons. Um, so the book is sort of meant to both describe this relatively common phenomena um, while also providing a little bit more context and nuance into some really critical cases like Iran and North Korea, and then sort of counteracting those cases or, or comparing those cases in relation to some of the bigger general trends that um, have happened over the past seven or so years. Um, and so uh, the sort of take home point at the, the bottom line up front is that um, we actually can do this pretty successfully. We've done it pretty successfully over the past seven years. Many more countries have started and then stopped their nuclear weapons programs than currently have nuclear weapons today. Um, and the best way to do this is, is really to provide this sort of combination of carrots and sticks. Um, so to give them something that they want while still threatening that if they don't sort of concede to our demands, um, more punishment or, or sort of more bad things could happen. And this is all in the context of threats of military force um, if they're available. And so this sort of uh, argument and this logic is relatively new and I think somewhat controversial in some ways, um, but I think it's been an effective tool and, and some of the data that I'm able to leverage suggests that it's been a pretty effective tool for the United States and potentially for other countries um, in the international community over the past um, a little bit less than a century. So. Yeah, I think there is some really interesting and rich nuance there. Um, so the countries that have either built up full operational weapons programs, there's been just a couple of cases of this. I think the, the most sort of famous one is South Africa. Um, that is going to be qualitatively, so to speak, different from other cases where um, maybe they developed an enrichment facility or maybe they started to think about developing um, nuclear latency or, or necessary components of the fuel cycle. And then the United States was able to persuade them not to progress further. And what that usually boils down to is just how expensive it is to buy off these programs, whether they require uh, monetary co compensation, um, military assistance, or something a little bit more elaborate and, and more sort of um, grand in scale, like a security guarantee or some other form of uh, defensive commitment. Um, so there is this sort of interesting nuance that I think also reflects the distribution of the carrots and sticks that are often necessary to, to actually get or incentivize the reversal. Um, so a nuclear weapon state, and I think in the sort of canonical literature and how policymakers and academics define it today, is a state that has an operational nuclear weapons program um, that has the ability to actually deploy those weapons. I think for the most part, that covers the, the permanent five members of the UN Security Council that have nuclear weapons in the United States, the UK, France, China, and Russia. Um, but it also describes the de facto um, nuclear weapon states, including India, Israel, and Pakistan. I say Israel, obviously they don't have a um, announced declared program, but it is our sort of international consensus that they have nuclear weapons and the ability to deploy them. The one state that is a little bit still ambiguous simply on the deployment part of North Korea, um, obviously they conduct tests, missile tests to demonstrate that capability, but there's still a little bit of um, uncertainty was as to whether or not they have the ability to miniaturize a, a warhead and place it on a deployable missile. Um, and so I say that just as a potential sort of caveat to this general definition. On the other hand, we have states that are nuclear aspirants. Um, that might mean that they have uh, engaged in some degree of technological acquisition, meaning that they have acquired nuclear latency or the technical components of a nuclear weapons program prior to getting the nuclear weapons themselves, or they're a nuclear aspirant in that they have um, announced their interest in nuclear weapons, have said publicly that they want to pursue or acquire nuclear weapons, and have either had similar technological development or they're lagging a little bit behind on the technology. The technology side. 
but I think those sort of cover the full universe of, of states. And I guess the last one, just for completeness purposes, are reversers. So states that had nuclear weapons programs, whether they were latent or weapons, and then decided to stop. Yeah, that's a tough one because oftentimes they keep those that they keep that last step sort of secret on purpose, right? So I think the best way of looking at it is, you know, do they have an operational nuclear warhead that they can miniaturize and put on a on a platform for delivery? Um, and I think that that last step is often one of the most challenging ones. Usually, it's it's something will get revealed or leaked in between those two final steps, but um, it's a, it's a difficult sort of progress or different development for states to have. Um, but I think that's probably what dif differentiates latent states from operational nuclear weapon states is that final ability to deploy nuclear weapons. If you're in the universe that I sort of talked about in my book, it's because the US has said to you, we'll give you something if you don't take that final step. We'll give you uh, massive amounts of money. We'll give you uh, military assistance. We'll place troops on your border to protect you from a threatening adversary. We'll provide a security guarantee. Um, we will encourage your sort of full inclusion in the international community. We'll lift sanctions. We'll end oil embargoes. Um, we'll encourage trade agreements or preferential trade agreements between you and other countries in the international system. And if there are enough sort of compensation or if there's enough concessions that are being offered by the U.S., um, some countries, actually many countries, are sort of willing to forego acquiring weapons um, which serve as a deterrent from some of those security threats, um, and in lieu get the sort of um, get either defensive commitments from the United States or all these other goodies that the U.S. and other countries might be offering. We're still trying to figure out exactly what some of the implications of this are. So there's work by uh, myself and my my co-author Rachel Whitlark, as well as Tristan Volpe, Matthew Furman, some of the other great scholars that are working on this. And we're all sort of trying to figure out what the scope is for the sort of implications or the um, consequences of having nuclear latency, whether or not it actually does provide a deterrent capability, whether or not it makes you more provocative or risk accepting and, and maybe even more conflict oriented in the international community. So there are still a couple of sort of mixed findings about this, but I think one of the reasons why a country might decide to shift from latent to full weapons is that they have a security threat that is unabating or that they're um, an adversary of the U.S. that and they don't believe that the United States will be able to provide a security guarantee or a defensive commitment. I mean, I think one of the best examples of this was probably Iran, which is um, obviously in an environment that they feel is threatening. Um, there is they have sort of adversaries and rivals throughout the Middle East that pose threats to them. Um, including uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia, and, and they're not uh, sort of a, a suspect or they're not really one of the options for getting a security guarantee from the United States. And so for them, um, you know, it is, it, it then could be understood that uh, the security threats that they face, the challenges that they face, having nuclear weapons is be more beneficial than um, acquiring the benefits from a nuclear reversal agreement. Uh, so those are some of the instances in which we might see a country be still motivated to acquire nuclear weapons. Obviously, North Korea is another great example of this. This is a tough one in part because you know there's a lot of things that have changed, not just the strategy itself, but also the, the credibility, the reputation of the Trump administration in contrast to the Bush administration or the Obama administration. I think in terms of the strategy itself, um, this is exactly what my book suggests we shouldn't do, which is simply punish without having some sort of compensation or some sort of concession available for leaders to take to their population and say, or their you know, domestic constituency or either or even other opponents or other sort of veto players in the political system and say, here's what the actual deal looks like. You know, we're getting these rewards. Um, and if we continue the program, this is the types of punishments we're going to get. The maximum punish, punishment strategy hasn't seemed to have any effect other than encouraging Iran to get nuclear weapons, continuing, encouraging them to continue to build out their nuclear weapons program um, without a lot of obstacles. Um, they're even willing to sort of handle the sanctions and use the sanctions as a political tool and political cover to get the population to be more interested in nuclear weapons than they were during the JCPOA era, which uh, sort of 
worked well with my theory to describe a situation where you're having both rewards and sanctions being applied at the same time to the effect of having counter cooperation and universal. So in that sense, um, I think my, my book and the argument that I put forward can really um, nicely explain why this strategy is unlikely to be effective and, and actually will probably lead to the continued program in Iran, if not an actual successful acquisition of nuclear weapons. I get this question a lot, especially since, you know, the historical record also suggests that we're not just pursuing uh, a policy of simply punishment. We've actually done this pretty successfully over the past 70 years, and we've managed to, you know, sort of navigate some of the political obstacles. My sense is that um, it's the result of a few different things. One is that uh, the rewards can be sometimes hidden because it's not always politically savory for US presidents or, or other leaders and other countries in the international community to, to show or demonstrate that they're offering rewards to what are seen as rogue or pariah states in the international system. Um, sometimes they're sort of slipped in and we don't always know the confines of it. So. Um, for example, in, in, in other countries that are allies of the US, like Taiwan and South Korea, um, the fact that they were being rewarded was sort of put in the middle of an otherwise sort of broader defensive co cooperative agreement with those countries as part of their alliances. Um, and I think sort of the last reason why we, we don't always see this or, or why it's not always demonstrated or there's a pretty significant focus on sticks in, their, in, in our rhetoric is that um, it's, they're often sort of the political tool of, of parties or administrations to show that they're being tough on these proliferators, um, even though we know that that's not always an effective strategy and, was, and usually is likely to have the sort of opposite conclusion or outcome than what we want. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it's, it's brings out some of the more interesting complications and, and nuances of the strategy. So, you know, in my book, I, I sort of, I, I simplify this a little bit by focusing on the US, but obviously we're not alone when we do this. And the JCPOA, um, as well as the Joint Plan of Action, which was a sort of predecessor to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action in 2015, as well as some of the other agreements that have been, um, that have been sort of developed by members of the P5 or the United States and its European partners, obviously are multilateral. They include a, a whole sort of variety of countries. The JCPOA is a great example of this. This was not only the United States, but members of the P5, as well as some other European allies. And they do play a big role, not just in um, facilitating the negotiations and facilitating a lot of the conversations and the outreach to potential tour traders. Um, you know, there's a great sort of story behind the JCPOA that shows that Oman actually played a surprisingly important role in um, sort of bringing together uh, President Rouhani in Iran and President Obama in the United States to, to see whether or not negotiation was even a, a potential possibility. Um, and in other instances, they play a major role in sort of the, the doling out or the contribution of these sanctions and rewards. For sanctions to be effective, um, the United States can impose unilateral sanctions, but usually they try to encourage multilateral sanctions so that um, that the target of the sanctions in question is actually getting sort of a broader set of punishments from um, the U.S.'s European allies as well as other countries in the international system. That's one of the challenges actually in the post-JCPOA world is um, encouraging the, uh, the U.S.'s European allies to impose sanctions on Iran, even though everyone else is in, uh, sort of supporting the deal and has been in compliance with the deal. Um, and in terms of benefits, um, you know, Libya is another great example of this. Um, the United Kingdom and the US work well together to stop Libya's nuclear program. Um, and the, sort of the UK was one of the sort of primary partners in negotiation and conversation on that deal as well. Um, so they do play a pretty significant role. And um, my sense, my, my sort of speculation is that as we move forward, um, depending on what happens in November and, and the next administration, whether it's a, a second term of the Trump administration or a new administration, it very well could be that um, many more of these conversations, these negotiations, the management of the non-proliferation regime may fall in the hands of European leaders rather than the U.S. Um, I think much of our sort of semblance of leadership, especially on this issue, has been um, 
has been eroded. And so I think it's going to be a, a, a tough challenge moving forward to see if we're going to either uh, come back into that leadership role or relinquish it fully to someone else. I think if I had an answer to that question, I would have a slightly different job and probably a higher paycheck. But um, uh, it's, I mean, I think this is a fascinating case for us right now because we're seeing, you know, this sort of strategic ambiguity doctrine play out in real life, which is kind of interesting and, and kind of, uh, from an analytical standpoint, really uh, exciting. Um, so my understanding, and again, I'm, I'm only able to look at the news reports and whatever's, you know, um, publicized on the Department of Energy websites and, and other open source information, but my understanding is that the Saudis have been pretty interested in acquiring some uh, forms of nuclear latency, whether, you know, it's minimal or initial components of the nuclear fuel cycle, including some, um, from what I gather, some reactor technology from the United States over the past few months. I think the interesting and, and maybe alarming part about this is that these deals have been done relatively secretly, even on the US side. We only really found out about the fast tracking of some of these agreements um, after the information was right, leaked or, or sort of revealed from the Department of Energy. Um, and the question then remains sort of what is Saudi's plan? Like why are they pursuing nuclear energy as one of the major oil exporters in the international system? Um, if it is the case that they're using these sensitive agreements to acquire technology that is dual use, meaning that they actually could be using it for civilian energy purposes, or they could be using it to develop nuclear weapons, um, I mean, I think that their, their situation might lead us to, to sort of speculate that they, they actually might be interested in nuclear weapons. Um, they're, their sort of situation, their, their proximity to adversaries like Iran, especially if Iran does acquire nuclear weapons themselves. Um, the, the developments on the ground in Saudi Arabia, including the sort of elevation of um, Prince Mohammed bin Salman as, as the de facto leader of Saudi and a lot of the actions that he has taken internationally over the past couple of years, including obviously the tragic murder of um, uh, Khashoggi, the, the Saudi journalist, as well as a lot of the other sort of controversial actions that have been happening over the past few months, suggest that there is different intentions for Saudi um, under his leadership, under his reign. It could be a slightly more aggressive, assertive, um, nuclear interested or a nuclear aspirant Saudi than we have not seen to date. Um, on the other hand, it, it could be that they sort of see the, the, um, the oil market and their position in the oil industry as, as evolving, especially if there is growing demand for alternative energy sources and that they want to um, sort of establish a foothold in the civilian energy market and establish that independence if they need, need to do so. It's really hard to tell right now where we stand in these two worlds. Um, and I, I think that's the, you know, it's, it's hard not to take into account some of the other behaviors outside of this nuclear sort of arena to, to establish what's going on in Saudi. But my hunch is that um, they're sort of seeing the world around them. They're seeing Iran, they're seeing Israel, they're seeing the Middle East and potentially looking to establish themselves either as a nuclear latent state that has the ability to switch to weapons um, as soon as they sort of turn on the light and do so, um, or as a nuclear weapon state themselves to ensure their own independence and their own security from threats, especially if um, their relationship with the United States uh, is to, you know, evolves or shifts, especially under a new administration. You know, I think President Obama's administration was a little bit more skeptical and sanguine about their relationship with Saudi, um, while the Trump administration has openly sought to not only um, restore, but expand and enhance those, um, that relationship and that alliance. So, Again, it might depend on what happens in November. Uh, this might be a little bit of a pessimistic outlook, but um, it's de definitely happened before. You know, I, I wouldn't say that it's outside the realm of possibility or a historical that um, the U.S. has sort of turned a blind eye to nuclear weapon states or nuclear aspirations or even development um, by friends or allies. Certainly, we dealt with that when actual allies of the U.S., um, like South Korea and Taiwan, became interested in nuclear weapons and tried to hide that development and that interest for a few years before the U.S. found out 
this came uh, to be an issue again with uh, both India and Pakistan during um, the, the Cold War when they were both allies to some degree um, of the U.S. and they were also pursuing nuclear weapons. So it's happened before that the U.S. has had to sort of have a, um, a less than linear path with regard to ally proliferation. There's some excellent work by Alexander Linoshka on this, uh, Jean Grigori, others that have sort of explored the, in, the impact of alliances on nuclear proliferation. But um, my sense is that certainly how some of this was conducted on the U.S. side has been a little bit different, especially since, especially after the Obama administration and even the Bush administration. Um, I think that the manner in which the deals were negotiated and that they were implemented, especially in light of new laws that um, impact the degree to which the U.S. is responsible for these agreements and how they sort of implement them, um, it was a little bit strange. I think it it probably is, um, you know, I, I don't know enough about the inner workings of the DOE and Secretary Kerry's sort of negotiations to know a lot about it, but my sense is that it is a little bit different than what we were expecting, but not so different than, you know, what has happened with the U.S. in the past. This is probably one of the few different factors that are weakening the U.S.'s hand. This is a huge one, sort of being um, idiosyncratic in the in the sort of strictness of US policy towards uh, new proliferates or countries that are interested in acquiring this type of technology. Um, I think it probably pales in comparison to the unilateral withdrawal from the JCPOA as a factor that influences US-Iran relations or how other countries are viewing the US's commitments and US credibility. Um, but certainly I think if you're sort of observing the best ways or some of the implications of the lessons to be learned from the Trump administration with regard to nuclear proliferation, I think two emerge is one, if you're going to do anything bad, be a friend of the U.S. and probably give them a lot of money in, in all sorts of uh, negotiations and deals. That seems to be one of the um, consequences of a more transactional foreign policy. And the second is don't dabble in nuclear latency. If you're going to acquire, if you're interested in nuclear weapons, go and get them like North Korea. Um, clearly, there's a big divide between how the Trump administration has dealt with, negotiated, sort of spoken with Iran versus how the Trump administration has dealt with North Korea. So if, if I were um, a country and I was interested in nuclear weapons, those are some of the lessons I would be learning is uh, be friends with the U.S., give them a lot of money, and then do this as quickly as possible neither of which are good for international security, nor do I condone them or accept them or even want them, but it's simply some of the lessons that we're learning from um, this, this era of foreign policy. I go back and forth on this probably every week or every month, and this was especially hard when I was finishing up the chapter of this book because I finished up sort of, you know, the Obama era section, then I added in the Trump era section, and this was, I think the first time I submitted the chapter it was during the fire and fury phase of the Trump uh, Trump Kim relationship, and then I had to add more sections to to include the summits and then the sort of the love relationship between Trump and Kim. I I don't I wish I had a crystal ball to predict what was going to go on with North Korea. Uh, my sense is that we're probably in the in the realm of. Um, figuring out the least bad options, and that's probably management of a North Korean nuclear program, trying to convince them not to expand it, trying to convince them not to develop um, additional delivery vehicles or platforms for um, launching nuclear weapons that would threaten our allies, especially South Korea, given its proximity, but also Japan and other countries in East Asia, working strongly with the Chinese to um, establish, uh, you know, sort of guidelines and rules and, and regulations for managing a sort of strong and safe nuclear North Korea, um, strong in the sense that the nuclear weapons are strongly protected and, and robustly secured, um, and eventually dealing with what happens next with a, a really shaky and uncertain North Korean regime, especially if um, there isn't a clear uh, successor to Kim Jong-un. Um, I'm not optimistic per se that we can acquire a, or we can implement a nuclear reversal deal, especially under this administration. Um, but I, I think that there are ways to manage the situation, to manage North Korea 
um, and its threats to international security in a way that won't pose significant challenges to, for example, the South Koreans or the Japanese. You know, in my book, I, I definitely have a role for military force and threats of military force to play, which is to be the sort of shadow that um, sort of supersedes all these negotiations and presents to a potential proliferator. This is ultimately what we'll do if you don't concede to our demand, if you don't sort of uh, concede to the negotiations. But in my analysis and some new work that I'm doing with Michael Joseph, um, we actually start to see some of the limitations of preventive military war, prevent, preventive military force as a tool when used on its own. Um, so in that work, um, which is more uh, formal theory based and some of my other research, which is more um, large and statistically based, we actually can see that military force may have a, a negative impact on nuclear reversal, meaning they actually might encourage countries to, per, to continue their nuclear weapons programs. And this is after the sort of momentary, um, temporary destruction of a facility. Um, I mean, I think we can imagine just from understanding human psychology a little bit that if uh, an actor takes that severe of an action, the, in, the inference or the sort of consequence on the um, on the target of that is may not be to just fold and say, all right, well, that's it. I guess someone's destroyed this facility and I'm not interested in doing this thing anymore. It actually exacerbates potentially one of the reasons they started a nuclear weapons in the program in the first place. Um, you know, if we follow Scott Sagan's three models in search of a bomb, which is one of the sort of canonical pieces on nuclear proliferation, security threats from major world powers like the United States is one of the very reasons why countries develop nuclear weapons programs. And if you go and actually do uh, the sort of consequence of that, new, of that security threat, which is destroy something on a, a country's land, um, they might actually feel more insecure about their position vis-a-vis -vis the United States and more interested in acquiring nuclear weapons. And that's what some of our data has been showing us. So um, I think on its own, it's a, it's a pretty dangerous tool. Um, certainly the United States contemplated over many different cases and many different times, um, military operations uh, in North Korea, maybe elsewhere. The North Korean case is probably the most um, sort of publicized um, then Secretary of Defense Bill Perry tried to put together some um, operational plans for a, a, a ground operation in North Korea, looked at what would happen in terms of civilian casualty loss and force depletion, tried to present those plans to um, President Clinton, both quickly realizing that that was incredibly um, sort of unsavory and, and going to be very politically unappealing with regard to how many lives would be lost in those operations and how dangerous. So we've done that preliminary work before, and I think we've come to the realization that for the most part, um, it's, it's really challenging to do in certain circumstances. So, um, and probably would have the opposite consequence or outcome than we actually want. Uh, this is a tough one because I, I think this is where my cynical pessimistic side really shows itself, which is, I'm I'm really I'm I'm really skeptical about the viability of a nuclear uh, a full nuclear ban and, and sort of global zero. I think it's going to be virtually impossible in this day and age when technology and the share of information and uh, a full sort of wide wide range of preferences, including preferences that might be more nefarious than we would like to believe they can be. Um, with all of that out there, it's going to be almost impossible to convince every leader to to both give up existing nuclear weapons programs um, and then to, to never pursue them in the future. Um, I think we've been demonstrating over the past 70 years that that's a really challenging, um, it's a really challenging process and it has not always been successful. We have managed to avoid um, the sort of the prediction that John F. Kennedy had about a world that was full of nuclear weapon states. And that's something that we should be very proud of ourselves for. Um, but I think this, the idea that everyone's going to give up their nuclear weapons, um, that we're all going to manage to avoid having nuclear weapons in the future, given that the information and the know-how on how to build them, how to operate them, how to deploy them, how to deliver them, is already out there. Um, it's available to both states and non-states. Um, I think it's really, it's really hard for me to imagine a future like that. That's not to say that... Um, you know, I don't want it or that it, if it were to happen, you know, it might have some very positive benefits. But I think if it, if it does happen, this is where some of our um, 
institutional experts and some of the experts on nonproliferation um, and the sort of nonproliferation regime and the, and the treaty, like Rebecca Davis Gibbons and others, really can teach us a lot about how to implement a set of institutions and a set of rules that can prevent re-proliferation. Man, I just coined a new word. So we'll see if that, I hope that doesn't happen, but um, you know, if, if, it, if we were to get to a place of global zero, how do we ensure that for um, the foreseeable future? And that's where I think some of the, the next wave of scholarship can start to look at is, you know, how do we control the spread of information? You know, how do we manage to avoid other forms of disruptive technologies that are as threatening or as damaging in some ways, obviously not in others, as nuclear weapons. And, that all is going to require a lot more thought and a lot more research.